Welcome to Ataxia UK's virtual annual conference 2022. This is the Cerebella Ataxia research update and I'm Emily Cutting. I'm the research manager at Ataxia UK. So just to give an overview of what I'll be talking about, I'm going to start with Ataxia UK activities within research and the process of research. I'll talk about developments in diagnosis and treatment of ataxia. Then I'll cover some European and global ataxia research initiatives that Ataxia UK is involved in. And I'll finish on clinical trials and some opportunities to take part in research. So starting with Ataxia UK activities and the process of research. People that have been coming to these talks for many years might be familiar with what Ataxia UK does, but just for anyone that isn't so sure, I wanted to cover a few things that the research department are involved in. So Ataxia UK funds research projects, and these are mostly small grants that researchers use to get initial results, which then allows them to apply for a bigger grant from elsewhere. And our 2022 research impact report showed that every pound a taxi UK spends on research projects raises almost five pounds in further funding for a taxi research, which is great for the taxi research field. We also organise research conferences. And the next one is coming up actually in a few weeks, and it's the International Congress for Taxi Research taking place at the start of November in Dallas. And we've organised this along with FARA and NAF, who are two American ataxia charities. And research, um, research conferences are a really great opportunity for researchers to come together to share ideas and to push their ataxia research forwards. And we'll probably be writing a summary of this conference in an upcoming magazine, so look out for that one. And this image just wants, is trying to show that the Taxi UK acts as the link between people affected by ataxia shown in the middle and all these different groups on the outside. So we work as the link with other ataxia patient groups and other charities, with regulators and pharmaceutical companies and with scientists and healthcare professionals around the world. And we do this in a number of ways. We help with recruitment to studies and I'll be doing some of that at the end of this talk. We help with patient engagement in research. We work with pharmaceutical companies to encourage their involvement in ataxia research. And where they have ataxia programs already, we assist where we can with those programs. We also collect useful information from people with ataxia. And this is to help pharmaceutical companies and other researchers to learn about ataxia from people that live with it and to make sure they're really answering the questions that people want answered. All this to say that we are engaged at all stages of research. I wanted to just cover the process of research quickly because I think we use a lot of these terms like preclinical and clinical trial without really explaining what it means and how it all fits together in the drug development process. So thinking particularly about drug development, this starts with preclinical research. And preclinical means laboratory based and it's testing the drug in cells or animal models it can take several years and they're looking at whether the drug works and also getting some idea on the dose and how safe it is before giving it to humans. If the preclinical work is successful it will move into clinical trials and the first of these is phase one and this can take several months and it's mainly looking at the safety of the drug and it's usually given to people that don't have the condition and they look at how the body processes the drug and its effect on the body. And they get some information on dosing. If the phase one trial is successful, it'll move to a phase two trial. This can take several months to a couple of years. And this is where they start to look at the potential risks and benefits of the drug. And it'll be given to people that have the condition and they'll see if it is effective and they'll also continue to study safety. If a phase two trial is successful, a drug will move into a phase three trial. This can take a number of years. And this is where you might hear about pl placebo control because some people on the trial will be given placebo, which is a pill which does nothing, and other people will be given the treatment. And researchers will be looking at those on treatment versus those on placebo and seeing if there's any effect of the drug. They'll be looking at the potential risks and benefits compared to no treatment or existing treatment, and they'll continue to look at the safety. And for rare conditions like ataxia, 
number of people in the trials are often smaller because obviously there's less people living with the condition and the different phases of the trials might be combined. So you might hear, for example, about a phase two, three trial where they've combined these two together. So that covers Ataxia UK and the process of research. So now I'm going to go on to development in diagnosis of ataxia. As we know, a lot of the ataxias are inherited and advances in the knowledge of genes that can cause ataxia mean more inherited ataxias can be identified. And a technique called whole genome sequencing or WGS is now available on the NHS. And this means that rather than looking at one or a handful of genes to see if there's any ataxia genes there, researchers and doctors can now look at the whole genome. So look at all the genes at once to see if there's um, any sign of a genetic condition there. We now know that whole genome sequencing can detect repeat expansion disorders, such as the scars. And we didn't think this was the case previously. This newspaper article I've shown on the right here is an article that was in The Guardian earlier this year about whole genome sequencing and how it can be used to detect repeat expansion disorders. And someone within this article had been diagnosed with FA at the London Ataxia Centre using this technique. Whole genome sequencing can also aid in the discovery of new conditions. So whenever anyone has whole genome sequencing done, they can opt to have their data put into research and researchers can then look across all this data across a lot of people that have undiagnosed conditions and can see, is there any genes there that are likely to be causing these conditions? A few years ago now, a genetic cause of a type of ataxia called CANVAS was identified by UK-based researchers. And they identified this in a gene called RFC1. And they think that RFC1 mutations might be a common cause of late onset ataxia. And the test for the RFC1 mutation is not yet available on the NHS, but can be organised by the researcher that identified the mutation. So if you have a diagnosis of ataxia without a specific type and are interested to find out if you have CANVAS, you can speak to your neurologist about this test and you can contact the research department at Ataxia UK for more information. There were also the non-inherited ataxia. So Professor Marios Hadjivasilu from the Ataxia UK accredited Sheffield Ataxia Centre is a leading expert in non-inherited ataxias. And this includes gluten ataxia and primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia. And these are two types of immune ataxia. So they start off with a trigger. This trigger starts an immune response and the immune response then attacks the cerebellum, causing degeneration of the cerebellum shown here in red. And as we know, degeneration of the cerebellum causes ataxia. And primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia is one of these immune-mediated ataxias. And Professor Hadjivasilu and Dr. Shanmugaraja, who are the two consultants at the Sheffield Ataxia Centre, have published papers on PACA. So PACA is caused by an immune response launching an unnecessary reaction against the cerebellum, as I just described. And sometimes the trigger of this immune response is known. So for example, in gluten ataxia, we know the trigger is gluten. If the trigger is unknown, the condition is PACA. There's no definitive test for PACA. Professor Hadjivasilu described a comprehensive list of clues in one of these papers that neurologists should look for when considering the possibility that someone has PACA. And a diagnosis can be made if certain criteria are fulfilled and if an experienced neurologist or a taxi specialist has ruled out other causes. PACA is a potentially treatable form of ataxia. So the team at the Sheffield Ataxia Centre treated 22 patients with an immunosuppressive drug called mycophenolate, which reduces the immune response that causes the ataxia. And they showed using brain scans and ataxia rating scales that those receiving treatment improved or stabilised and those who didn't got progressively worse. If you've been diagnosed with idiopathic ataxia, and would like to explore the possibility that you might have PACA, we recommend that you speak to your neurologist about these publications and you can get them from the research department if that's something that you're interested in. So now I'm going to move on to developments in treatments for ataxia. So as we know, 
the scars are genetic. Um, and how this occurs is that you have a gene shown here in blue and a gene produces a protein. So if there's no mutation in the gene, the gene produces a normal protein and there's no disease. However, in the case of some of the scars, there might be um, a mutation in the gene. So shown here, there's an expanded region, or there could be a mutation. And this gene still produces a protein, but because of the mutation, it produces a disease-causing protein, which then goes on to cause the ataxia. And some forms of gene therapy aim to prevent the gene from producing this protein. And studies have shown success in this in animal models using this approach. And there are some uh, projects looking at this at the moment. So Vico Therapeutics have a scar therapy called VO659, which is a gene therapy, and they're planning to start trials in SCAR1 and SCAR3. And Q-State Biosciences have identified a type of gene therapy called ASO for the scars, and they've shown positive results in cell and animal models. Taxi UK recently funded a project on SCAR1 looking at a type of gene therapy called SMART, with these two researchers here. And if this were to be successful, this could also be applied to other SCARs as well. That brings me on to some other Ataxia UK funded projects looking at treatments for the Ataxias. So we're currently funding two research groups in Portugal, one of which is looking at nanobodies as a treatment for SCAR3, and another is using antidepressants to treat SCAR3. We funded two projects on spastic ataxia type 8, aiming to conduct a natural history study and develop gene therapy for this, treat, for this condition. And these grants were made possible by a generous donation from the DVS Foundation. Ataxia UK and the US Foundation Cure DRPLA have a research programme working on DRPLA, which is a rare form of ataxia. And there'll be a research update on this tonight at five o'clock. So all the treatments that I've talked about there are aiming to target the cause of the ataxia. But of course, we also need to target the symptoms that progress with ataxia. So we need treatments, for example, for speech difficulties. And Ataxia UK have funded projects on speech therapy for people with ataxia. And this work has shown that speech therapy focusing on good voice production and clear articulation can help some people improve their speech and their confidence. And this has also been tested in a peer support model in collaboration with Ataxia UK. So in this model, people involved had speech therapy with a speech therapist, they were given some exercises to do, and then they met in a peer support group without the speech therapist over quite an intensive period of a few weeks to practice the exercises together. And this model has been called Clear Speech Together and it was recently published as a successful method of providing speech therapy. Professor Lowit, shown here, does a lot of this speech therapy research, and she is currently testing one more therapy to decide on the best approach before finalising plans for a larger trial. So moving on to some European and global ataxia research initiatives that Taxi UK is involved in. So these research initiatives are groups of researchers that come together with a common question and support each other to advance their research and to get these questions answered. And they quite often want patient input, input from people that live with the condition. And that's where Ataxi UK comes in. So one of these is the Cerebellum and Emotional Networks project. This, is this group of researchers are investigating the neuronal basis of emotion focusing particularly on the role of the cerebellum in emotion. And Eurotaxia is one of the charity partners working on this project. Treat Arca is a group of researchers studying autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxias, and their focus is on testing treatments in animal models of RSAX and CoQ8A ataxia, which are two types of recessive ataxias. And Eurotaxia is representing people with ataxia with support from Ataxia UK. Similarly, the PROSPACS project, this is a large study taking place across Europe and Canada and includes the UK. And they are aiming to study spastic ataxias over time to learn about progression. And they're starting with RSACS and SPG7. 
They also hope to learn about biomarkers and animal models, both of which are critical for drug development. And all of this is in order to become ready for clinical trials when drugs are ready to be tested. And again, Eurotaxia is representing people with ataxia with support from Ataxia UK. And the Ataxia Global Initiative is a worldwide network of ataxia specialists, and they're looking at both rare and common types of ataxia. And this specialist group includes researchers, pharmaceutical companies and patient groups. And Ataxia UK's head of research is on the executive committee for, Atax for the Ataxia Global Initiative. And they're aiming to get consensus on standardised data and sample collection, again, to help with clinical trials when trials are ready to be run. They're coordinating research projects globally, and they're also involved in education and training of young investigators. And this global approach of bringing people from all around the world is really key for rare conditions like ataxia, because when we are ready to run trials, the likelihood is they'll need to be done in a number of countries because the number of people with the condition in one country just won't be high enough. So this is a really important initiative to drive research forwards. Finally, I want to finish with clinical trials and some opportunities to take part in research. Ataxi UK are funding a symptom relief trial and these researchers in Italy are looking at applying a low electrical current to the scalp and they think this may alleviate the symptoms of ataxia. So they're using a portable small device that's non-invasive, it sits against the scalp and it transmits this low electrical current across certain regions of the brain. And they have tested a technique called TDCS in an Ataxia UK funded trial in Italy for a range of different ataxias. And last year they showed results that showed improvements in ataxia rating scales. There are a few other research groups looking at this and they've shown mixed results. So this is ongoing at the moment. We have now funded this same group to test a technique called TACS, which is slightly different and they think it could potentially be more effective than TDCS. So this trial is ongoing at the moment and we look forward to hearing the results soon. Intrabio are a pharmaceutical company with a symptom relief drug called IB1001, which is currently in clinical trials. They announced positive results from these trials in Neiman Pick Type C and Tay Sachs, which are two neurodegenerative conditions with ataxia as a symptom. IB1001 targeted the ataxia symptom and they showed an improvement in ataxia rating scales in these trials. They're currently carrying out a trial in ataxia telangiectasia and looking at developing IB1001 for other neurodegenerative conditions as well. And I've just put here that they have orphan drug designation, which means it's a designation given by the regulatory agencies that shows the drug is being developed for a condition which has no treatment. And it gives some advantages to the developers and it can help with the drug development process. And these orphan drug designations that Intrabio have include the SCARs. CLOS Therapeutics have a triolose trial, which is a phase two, three trial testing triolose in people with SCAR3. And it's a one year trial and it will be taking place in up to 30 sites across the world. And recruitment has already begun in the US. You may have heard of this one, it's called the STRIDES trial. Research has shown that triolose can help clear out damaging molecules in cells in conditions such as SCAR. The Biohaven trial of troriluzole, which is a symptom relief trial, recently ended. So this was a phase three trial for a year and they looked at troriluzole in a number of different SCARs. And unfortunately, the results showed that the main measure they used to see if treatment worked, which was an ataxia rating scale, was not improved by troriluzole on the trial. However, when they looked only at participants with SCAR3, they did see an improvement in the ataxia rating scale. So Biohaven now plans to discuss these results with the regulatory agency in the US to see if there's a way to move this programme forward, given these positive results in scar -free. So the next few studies that I'll talk about are ones that are all recruiting at the moment. So the SCAR3 Natural History Study is called ESME, 
And this study aims to create a patient registry and carry out a natural history study. The natural history study looks at the progression over time and helps us to better understand that progression. So they're doing this in SCAR3. They also recently identified possible biomarkers for SCAR3. And biomarkers are a way of measuring progression of condition and they're really crucial for the success of clinical trials. So this was really important work. This ESME study is a multi-center study coordinated from Germany and involving five countries, one of which is the UK, and the London Ataxia Center is recruiting. So if you've been diagnosed with SCAR3 and are interested in taking part, please contact the team at UCL. Ataxia UK is funding a SCAR6 gate project. And taking part in this one will involve one visit to the study site in Newcastle and wearing a sensor at home for seven days, as well as looking at balancing gates in people with SCAR6. This study will hopefully generate useful data in support of using gait measurements in future trials. And the site in Newcastle is recruiting. So if you've been diagnosed with SCAR6 and are interested in taking part, please contact the team on this email address. There's an RSACS project currently recruiting and they are taking a measurement from the eye called OCT to find out whether this can be used to diagnose RSACS and to better understand the clinical features of RSACS. And again, the London Ataxia Centre is recruiting. So if you've been diagnosed with RSACS and are interested in taking part, you can contact the team on this email address. Now, a couple of healthcare research projects that are available for people with all types of ataxia. Um, Google have an AI for social good program, and part of this is Project Euphonia. The people are collecting speech samples. They're collecting speech samples from people with speech difficulties in order to improve voice recognition technology. So, for example, if you use Google Assistant or Siri, they're not always very good at understanding people that have speech difficulties. So this project is aiming to improve that technology by collecting samples from people with speech difficulties. And we have a survey at the moment on moving from child to adult healthcare services. And the aim of this study is to produce a report for clinicians and other professionals about how to improve the care they deliver and the guidance for young people and families on what you should expect when moving from child to adult healthcare services. And finally, one upcoming opportunity is the Biogen SCAR3 trial. So Biogen are starting a phase one trial, for people with SCAR3, testing their treatment BIIB132. And this is a antisense oligonucleotide or ASO, which is a type of gene therapy. So it can block the ability of a gene to make a protein. This is a small trial taking place in 21 sites with a total of 48 participants and will include the UK. And this will be the first in human study of this treatment. Um, the recruitment for the UK site is not yet open. I encourage everyone to join Ataxi UK and to opt to receive our newsletter and magazine to be kept informed of new research opportunities such as this one when they start to recruit. All studies and chances for taking part in research can be found on our website. So if you go to Ataxia Research and then take a part in research shown here with the big purple arrow, then you'll be given this menu of the different types available. So you can go to um, ones for people with cerebellar ataxia or healthcare research, which is where you'll find the Google and the survey. And again, we advertise all opportunities to take part in our newsletter and magazine. Thank you for listening.